the 81st Wildcats can forget it. Seems a lot longer than it really is since the days we played around here. Those four days at Waikiki, those Wahinis, if you got lucky. Of course, there were guys who'd rather go swimming. That's us. July 1944, sleeping in the hot sun after all those rugged months of jungle training. Fat, sassy, and shaved. We thought then we knew all the answers. This came under the heading of morale building. Of course, some characters needed more than others. While we were taking it easy, headquarters was doing its job. General Richardson, commanding general, Pacific Ocean area, and his staff were cooking up a different kind of party for us. It began the day we started on the boat ride, wondering where the hell we were going and how we were going to do when we got there. Two solid years of training in back of you, but training and climbing through the ropes on fight night are two different things. There were more than a couple of guys climbing that gangplank who were giving that subject their private attention. And we shoved off on our little excursion of about 6,000 miles over water. We were going down under. That's all we knew. We'd have even been glad to see a Capu sign if it were standing on dry land. Every man with a cabin to himself. Picture of a guy getting fixed up to go to a concert. But it never made you stop wondering where you were going. Time on our hands, so we figured out ways to spend it. With a few bucks thrown in for a side bet. One way of getting tired enough to climb into your bunk. Back the loser, bub. On number three hatch port side, the admirers of Lower Basin Street chamber music got it their way. Remember Curly Miller? The boy can really go to town. The day we crossed the equator and the shellbacks got their crack at the polywogs. And there's still some of us in the outfit who take off at the sight of a curved stick. No, brother, that is not beer. Clipped, goosed, slugged, and half drowned, but no beefs. The collar merchants fitted the general for size. The local barbers gave him a once-over lightly. Dental inspection. A rub down at the club. The treatment's finished and the general's a shell back. When you look back now, you can remember a lot of laughs on that boat ride, but mostly it was just plowing along through that ocean, under that sky tent, and waiting and watching for Jap subs or carrier planes. There was plenty of time for thinking. Thirty days for it. Thinking about a lot of things you remembered. Sometimes about what was ahead. That was a special kind of thinking. And when you looked around, you saw you weren't the only one doing it. Somehow it made you feel a lot closer. It was the end of August when we dropped anchor off Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands to go ashore for our dry run. There weren't any 
Jap capital signs on the beach. But when you hit it, you got that quick flash about the guys who were here ahead of us at Guadalcanal and the job they did. To look at it, you couldn't believe that beach had ever felt the bite of live ammo. They said we did okay on the canal dry run. When we left the Solomons, we still didn't know where our next stop was, but it was getting closer. And when we got there, somebody was going to be shooting at us. All hands, all hands. Now hear this. The objective of this task force is the Palau Islands, eight degrees north of the equator and 530 miles east of the Philippines. By occupying these islands, we will complete the sealing off of the important Jap strongholds to the east. Truk, Ponape. We'll help protect General MacArthur's right flank when he strikes against the Philippines. General MacArthur? Back to the Philippines? But what was our job going to be exactly? Angor. That's our job. Southernmost of the Palau group. About three square miles of limestone and coral. Japs got a lot of their phosphate here. Okay, what do we do? The 322nd hits Red Beach in the northeast. The 321st will land on Blue Beach. 323rd stands offshore in reserve. General Miller and Admiral Blandy knew that the Japs were expecting us in the south. We were going ashore through the choppy surf under the narrow beaches in the north. Fan out fast until the two beachheads joined up, then moved down the island. This was finally it. But the last two years had been four. We had the training and we had the weapons. There was Angar. On it, holed up in caves and pillboxes was a tough Jap regiment with plenty of experience in China back of them. This was our first time. How are we going to do? Remember the morning of September 17th? The carriers opened the show.
Okay, first wave shove off. That's us. Let's go. machine gun fire and mortars. It helped to see other guys looking like you felt. But they were taking it too. That helped more. Blue Beach. Machine gun fire wasn't so bad. Our planes knocked out their mortars. But still no place to get caught with your pants down. They had no regular defense line. They melted right into the ground. We had to blast or burn every damn last one of them out. Naval artillery raised so much hell with Blue Beach, the Amtrak's had a tough time making it. Back at Red Beach, things had got better. We were able to move in off the beach, which was also nicely torn up. We started blasting them out of their rat holes with satchel charges. By H plus one hour, we had a combat intelligence center operating. But we couldn't locate anybody for intelligence to talk to. They wouldn't come out alive. casualties down to the beach while we went on burning and blasting, extending the beachhead. And for every letter that went out, six other guys came in. As soon as we had a good toehold, landing craft started delivering in back of us, building up an ammo dump. The Japs were still on high ground to the northwest with mortars. They hit the dump. Most of it. But who wants to be a fireman at a time like this? General Miller came ashore the next morning to get a first hand look at the scoreboard. It was no setup. Inland, the Japs were acting tough. We'd had snipers and mortars on us all that first night. Plus, they're trying to infiltrate through the lines for some quiet knife work. That second morning, we were behind schedule. Red and blue beachheads still weren't joined up. But we kept slugging until we did join up. And all the time moving inland. Then we got to Shrine Hill, remember? 
15 feet deep, dug out of solid coral. Entrances barricaded with coconut logs, leaving firing slits only a couple of inches wide. They were tough monkeys. There'd still be some of them in there firing even after you'd put a 25-pound satchel charge under them. Tough, all right. But they could be had. So we took Shrine Hill. One place where they wouldn't pray to their ancestors anymore. Then we got to Saipan Town. What was left of it? By this time, we'd cooked, blasted, or shot 600 of the little apes. And had what we came for, including the phosphate plant. These phosphate diggings, about the best in all the Jap-mandated islands, were out of business at this stand permanently. We weren't taking chances. They know how to hide like the murdering weasels they are. We heard that some of them were still on high ground up to the north. But by the end of the third day, we'd shoved them back into the northwest corner in the southern tip of the island. The first chance to let down in three days. While you clowned around, there were a couple of things rattling around in the back of your head. These guys you'd been with a couple of years, you realized you hadn't really known them until the morning you hit the beach together. You had a different angle on them now, and wondered if they were thinking about that too. this had been going on, our 321st pulled out for Peleliu Island, six miles to the northeast. The first Marines were finding it heavy going up there. The 321st went up to give them a hand. The rest of us who stayed on Angar had our own job to finish. The jungle was still lousy with Jap snipers, but we couldn't wait to clean them out to get the airstrip in. With a rifle covering every couple of axes, the aviation engineers started hacking out the strip. The sooner it's in, the sooner we can use it as a base to plaster the rest of the Palau's. Not quite right for a B-29 yet, but recon planes could start to use it and did. first was battling Japs. Angar was ours, but not quite. Up in the northwest corner, there's a piece of high ground we were starting to call Suicide Hill. To get to it, we had to move up the narrow gauge leading from the phosphate works into the defile that for good reason got the name of Buddy Gulch. of Jap machine guns and snipers up there, too. A Jap 75 mounted on rails kept poking out, firing, and pulling back into a cave. We couldn't see what the hell was going on up ahead, but the tanks could. They were checking with each other over the radio. Vincent, repeat your last transmission. I did not hear. Over. I said we're stopped by enemy fire at the head of the gulch. Tell you what to do. After the wounded are removed, use your 
What about enemy fire? Over. We can't get up there. They can get up there. We're under fire all right, but those litter bearers are working right in it. They're bringing those guys out with stuff kicking up all around them. Brother, what guts? All right, then. I'll contact three. As soon as our wounded are out of the gulch, we'll blast. Or uh, will any combat vehicle to the rear speak to me? Come in, please. Over. Okay, Cyclone. This is Calcutta. Over. I want you to warn all infantry in your vicinity to take cover. Get them off the rails. We're going to blast up ahead. Now to any combat vehicle near there. Pull back out of the way. Acknowledge. Acknowledge. I heard you, Cyclone. This is Rose. I'm right in there, but not too close. Not too close, he says. But the way is cleared now for the 2nd Battalion to move through the gulch. We were going to start a little encircling maneuver. So we split up. Some of us went up the rise to the right. The rest of us went to the left, going in with everything we could carry. Yeah, and everything we could throw. It was going to be suicide hill for the Japs now. We had them really hold up now. We called back for mortars and 155s. on Angar, and the end of our first fight. It had been no cinch. They'd poured everything they'd had on us from 75s down. But we'd won our first battle, and we had a right now to call ourselves the 81st Wildcats. When you watch those guys come out, you realize something you hadn't known. How mad you got when the bastards hit the guy next to you. Colonel Venable, our regimental commander, was hit by that 75. With the rest of our officers, he'd been right up there with us. down, the 81st had gone in and come out all right. These are the faces of men who fight. These are the tired faces of men who have seen death. These are the faces of men from your own hometown who carried the flag of America a step nearer to Tokyo. Look at these faces. Here's the boy who sold you gasoline on a Sunday afternoon. Here is an American boy. Looks tired, doesn't he? He is. Here's the boy who came calling on Saturday evening and took your daughter to a movie. Here's the boy that everyone predicted would make All-American when he went to the state university. But he didn't go. These men don't like war. But the enemy must be met and destroyed wherever he can be found. They know that. And so do you. Are you doing everything you can to help them? Are you buying war bonds? Bonds that pay for the weapons with which they fight? Bonds that provide places for them to rest, 
and hospitals in which their wounds may heal. Are you buying war bonds to the limit of your ability to ensure that a strong and worthwhile America will be waiting when these men return?